Today we're going to be talking about how to be a good bear wrestler. I had a chance to call a few people this morning who came last week, and I said, don't miss today. We're going to be talking about how to manage stress. And they said, well, that's the reason I can't come. I'm under, I'm under so much stress. One guy said he came anyway, that he worked it out to come. But, uh, you know, I guess we all experience stress in our lives. We all have colds. We all have stress. It, it's really not the stress that's so bad, but it's how we handle it, how we manage it. After all, what would life be like with no hits, no runs, and no errors? I want you to listen very closely today because we're going to be talking about some very practical things that you can use in your life to manage stress. Would any of you be willing to say that you do have some stress in your life? Raise your hand. <laughs> As many of you know who've been coming every week, um, I didn't enter the ministry until I was 50 years of age. I was a university coach and director of athletics on the campus for almost 18 years. Then I spoke full-time in the marketplace for almost nine years, and at age 50, entered the ministry. So I've done a lot of different things to bring me to where I am today. And I can tell you that along the way, there were many times that I did not do very well in handling stress. There, there are some people that can just blow off everything. You know people like that. You may be one of them. I can't seem to blow off anything. But I want to talk today about some practical things we can do. I, I went to Furman University, a small a little school in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains as director of athletics. Now, I'd been the head track coach at the University of South Carolina with an unlimited budget. Went to Furman University to be an athletic director, and I shared this, I think, a week or two ago, that I really didn't know what athletic directors were supposed to do. But the guy that was there before me played golf four days a week. <laughs> went out to lunch every, every day with a different alumni, and the alum always paid for it. And I told Charlotte, I know I can learn to do that. It may take me a while, but I'm going to learn to do this job. Well, I hadn't been there very long when the president called me and started talking to me about deficit. And I didn't know what deficit meant. He said, deficit is when you spend more than you take in. I said, are we doing that? And he explained to me, got out the budgets and showed them to me. And I realized that we needed to do some things to pay for our athletic program. And I believe that intercollegiate athletics is very important, was important on that campus. And we wanted to have a well-rounded program for both our men and our women. And so I set about doing some crazy different kinds of things to sell tickets, to promote the games. And uh, you've heard uh, me tell the stories about the football games and some of the things we did. Well, basketball season came around. We had a good basketball program. We'd been to the NCAA playoffs the year before. We'd lost to Indiana in the second round of the NCAA playoffs. Uh, but coming back from that team, we had seven foot two inch Fesser Leonard, our center. His nickname was Moose. And I had a, a bumper sticker made that said, the moose is loose. And I would go around and put it on cars while people were eating or in the movie, whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> We had 6'10 Clyde Mays, who was drafted uh, at the end of that year in the first round by the Milwaukee Bucks. We had a good basketball program. But for some home games, we didn't draw real well. Now, we had the only basketball coach I've ever known that could overspend an unlimited budget. And we had, to, we had to pay for that program. Well, we were fixing to play a team that had only won one game and lost 18. And we weren't selling a lot of tickets. Now, we had Clemson University 20 miles down the road. A lot of people went to the Clemson games. ACC basketball was on television, a lot of cable games. I mean, you can, you can sit home any night now and watch two basketball games on television. Well, for some home games, we didn't draw real well, real well. We were playing this one team, had won one game, lost 18. We hadn't sold a ticket. Well, two weeks before that game, I looked at that thing. I said, we've got an opportunity here to do something, or we've got a real problem. And I wanted to do something to try to sell out that game. When I heard about this guy that had a wrestling bear by the name of Victor, the guy lived in Cherokee, North Carolina, and a friend of mine gave me his number, and I called him up. I said, tell me about your bear. He said he's a wonderful bear. <laughs> his name is Victor, and the way we work this is we can come to your game, and at the halftime, we put down a wrestling mat. You line up three or four guys who agree to wrestle the bear, and it's really a big deal. People really enjoy it. I said, can you bring him over on this night? He said, we'll be there. You line up three guys to wrestle that bear. Well, I got to thinking, who would I really like to have wrestle that bear? <laughs> Well, the president of the university was number one on my list. <laughs> but he said, no way I'm wrestling that bear, West." Well, Sam Weich, who is now the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, was living in Greenville. Sam's a good friend of mine. He'd been our quarterback when he was at Furman. Sam said, I'll wrestle that bear. You know, he thought he'd kill the bear. The second guy to wrestle the bear was a local TV sports personality. A little bit like Dale Hansen. You know what I mean? Some people liked him. Anyway, he said, I'll wrestle the bear. <laughs> And I invited my pastor to come wrestle that bear. 
I figured he'd take his mind off of fighting with the deacons, you know. He'd come fight. The... Well, we put these guys' picture in the paper. We made it bear night. Well, the word got out, started selling tickets. Sports Illustrated cost said, we're going to have a photographer there to see this bear wrestling deal. Well, the story got out, you know, bear night. Everybody was coming. We sold out the Coliseum. I couldn't believe it. People were coming to see that crazy bear. Well, the guy told me he'd be there about 4.30 in the afternoon. I went down to the Coliseum there, Greenville Memorial Auditorium. I like to call it a Coliseum. It makes it sound better. And he drove up about 4.45 in an old black Cadillac hearse, about a 1965 Cadillac hearse. And in the back was this bear just kind of roaming around. And his wife, in the front seat was his wife. I said, y'all always travel this way? He says, no, sometimes the wife will stretch out in back and Victor right up here with me. <laughs> Well, I had invited these three guys down to a Meet the Bear Fellowship before the game. I wanted them to meet the bear because I told them they're just a wonderful bear, friendly. Victor, if you take that card over the front, that is the actual picture. Uh, Victor on his hind legs was seven feet tall. He weighed 500 pounds. He had a tongue two feet long <laughs> and real bad breath. <clears throat> these guys says, Wes, we're not going to wrestle that bear. You're crazy. This is just another one of your crazy promotions. There's no way we're going to wrestle that bear. Well, my wife was there. I started crying. I said, honey, what are we going to do? I said, we've sold out the Coliseum slash auditorium. People are coming from all over. Sports Illustrated is going to be here. Honey, what are we going to do? She said, Bob, I know what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to wrestle that bear. Well, I had shirts made for these guys, and uh, these guys said, Wes, if you wrestle a bear, and the bear doesn't kill you, we'll wrestle it. Well, one of them gave me a shirt I had to put on there, Grin and Bear It, which I thought was kind of neat. Well, halftime came, nobody left the auditorium. Nobody went to get a coat. Nobody went to the, nobody left. The word got out that this bear was going to kill the athletic director. Nobody wanted to miss it. <clears throat> well, the guy goes out there, he puts the wrestling mat down. I walk out there kind of sheepishly. And, uh, and when I came out, when the bear came out, everybody started applauding and screaming. When I came out, they booed. <laughs> Well, I get on that wrestling mat, and his trainer was right there with him. Now, here's Victor, seven feet tall, 500 pounds, a tongue, two feet long, remember, real bad breath. The bear knocks me down. He puts his paw on my windpipe. I can't breathe. And I look over, and I see my wife, Charlotte, and she's cheering. <laughs> and then that bear started licking me with that tongue back and forth. Oh, it was awful just licking me over and over again and the trainer let him do it and I'm just laying there helpless and they're cheering. <laughs> well, the bear didn't kill me, but he almost did. The second guy to wrestle the bear was the local TV sports personality who wore a hairpiece and didn't think that anybody knew it. <laughs> Victor knew it. Victor took one slap at the old boy, his head went one way, and the headpiece went the other way. And he was just laying there, looking like a dead possum laying on the floor. The guy gets mad, he storms off the floor. He won't even pick up his hairpiece. It's probably still laying there. The guy got real mad. We never got another mention on that television station. It was something. You know what I found out? That if I was going to make it in my work, if I was going to be able to hang in there and make it, I was going to have to learn to be a good bear wrestler. Oh, I don't mean I was going to have to wrestle more bears like Victor, but I was going to have to wrestle bears like faculty and students and alumni and news media and just people. And if I was going to hang in there and make it, I needed to learn to be a good bear wrestler. Let me ask you a question today. Any of y'all wrestling any bears in the corner of the world where you live? We all are, aren't we? Only one guy raised his hand, honest. <laughs> You know, I believe that we can be successful as bear wrestlers, but we need to learn to manage the stress that's in our life. Now, I'm thankful for a certain amount of stress because it's a certain amount of stress that motivates me. It's a certain amount of stress that gets me up earlier in the morning, maybe than I'd like to get up. It, it's a little bit of stress that makes me get after it and, and, and makes me want to make some things happen, it makes me want to get the job done. You see, that stress is good and it's healthy for us, so don't, don't get mad at all stress. But it's that negative stress. It's that stress that pulls us down. It's that stress that sidelines us. It's that stress that makes us want to give up. It's that stress that makes us want to quit and just walk away. 
We need to learn to handle that stress. You know, one other part of that story, I thought it was a great deal. We made a lot of money off that game, sold the place out. I, I thought people had a great time. Uh, I was a little anxious about it when it was over. I still have a little shake that I hadn't gotten over. <laughs> the president calls me the next morning. Oh, oh, and I need to tell you this. The way the guy rewarded the bear is every time the bear did what he told him to, the guy would reach into this bag and pull out a great big old bottle of Coca-Cola. I mean a great big old bottle. And that bear would hold it in his paws and chug along that bottle of Coca-Cola. Everybody thought that was great. The president called me the next morning and said, Johnny said, uh, I thought that was great last night, but he said, uh, how come the bear was drinking Coca-Cola? I said, well, you know, I didn't know what that co uh, uh, bear's preference was in, in colas. He said, well, you know, the, the chairman of the board of trustees was my guest last night. He is the president of the Pepsi-Cola bottling company. <laughs> you can't win. You just can't win. There was more stress. Let's talk just briefly about some things that we can do to handle the stress. If you got that card, you might want to flip it over and, and take a note. But you know, you are going to have bears to wrestle. If you're not wrestling one right now, you've just finished wrestling one, or you're going to wrestle one, right? I mean, it's going to happen. You know, Jesus took, told his little band of followers one day, he said, uh, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you'll have peace, but in the world you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus went on to say, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus knows all about the stress that we face every day, but he's made provision for us. Number one, I want you to write these things down. How to be a good bear wrestler. Number one, don't feed the bears. Don't feed the bears. I worked at Yellowstone one summer when I was in college. Another guy and I, we just took off and drove to Yellowstone. Got to the front gate and we said, is there anybody hiring? And they said, yeah, go to Hamilton Stores. They're hiring. You can get you a job. I went to Ham Hamilton Stores. They hired me that day, started the next day. I worked at a soda fountain at Hamilton Stores. It was me and 13 college girls. <laughs> Greatest two days I ever spent in my life. <laughs> After two days, they transferred me to the loading dock with a bunch of ugly guys. <clears throat> but one of the things we used to do, you know, when you went into Yellowstone, there were signs, don't feed the bears, because those bears would come right up to your car and put their, their paws on your car. Now, this boy I was up there with was kind of a wild guy, and we'd go out at night sometimes, those bears would come up kind of close to you early in the morning, put their paws on the car, and he'd take along a, a can of shaving cream, and he'd put shaving cream on the bears. And everybody think they were rabid, you know. It scared people to death, man. I saw one guy, he's still running, saw that bear. Don't feed the bears. If you can find out what's causing your stress, if you can figure out what it is, then either learn to deal with it or avoid it. A lot of times, uh, we know something's going to uh, get us, and we just go right back into it, don't we? I was with my granddaughter this weekend. And, uh, you know, grandkids love for you to bite on them. I bite on their arms, you know. And my little grandson, Matthew, he's only uh, about a year and a half. And I'll hold Matthew, and he'd stick his finger in my mouth, and I'd bite it. And he'd pull it out. You know what he'd do? Stick it right back in there. And we just played that little game. He'd stick his finger in my mouth, and I'd bite it. Why is it we do that? We know that things are going to hurt us. We know things are going to be negative in our lives, and we just keep going back. We just get up and go back. You know, there's some things we just need to avoid. Now, now you can't avoid everything like your boss. <laughs> and some things you've got to go back, but learn to deal with that. Don't feed the bears. Don't, don't keep giving them stuff to run you down. Number two, get moving. Get moving. I don't mean to redo your resume and move. That's not what I mean. I mean get active. You know the thing that works for me most of all when I'm under a lot of stress? And I've made it a priority of mine every day to get some kind of exercise. If it's just to go to the mall and walk around the mall, I'm going to get some exercise Every day, even when I feel the worst, every time that I exercise, it always makes me feel better. I believe that exercise is nature's number one tranquilizer. You know, people say, why do you exercise? I say, well, it's, it's good for my heart and lungs. Why else do you exercise? Well, I, I know it's good for my weight control. Why else do you exercise? It makes me feel good. The reason that I exercise is that when I finish, I feel good. I have more energy than I did before I started. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But it's true. Number two, get moving. The Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means we're to take care of our bodies. You know, a lot of times when we get under a lot of stress, we go eat, don't we? And then we eat some more. And then we lay down, and then we eat some more. And then we really feel bad. When you're under a lot of stress, get moving. Number three, ask for some help. Ask for some help. You know, there's not a day goes by that I don't ask God to help me in an area of weakness in my life or if something's bothering me, he really does care. John 16, John 16, 24 says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, 
and you shall receive that your joy might be made complete. Ask for help. You can turn any care into prayer anywhere. You really can. Turn it over to God. Philippians 4, 6 is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. You might want to write that down. It says, be anxious for nothing. You know what that means? That means don't worry. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. To guard your hearts means to build a fortress around it. That when you're involved in something that's causing anxiety, stress, even depression, you ask God to come to your rescue. Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Ask for some help. The greatest power source we have is God, and God cares about you. He cares about the stress that you're under today. He cares about your anxiety. He cares about your depression. He just plain cares about you. Ask him to help you. Number four, tell somebody. Tell somebody. Find a friend that you can confide in and tell them what's going on in your life. You know, the book of Proverbs says, Seek wise counsel. That means seek out some people you can talk to. You know, a friend is that rare person who asks how you are and then wait to hear the answer. That's a friend. Someone who asks, how, how are you doing? How are you really doing? And then hangs around for the answer. I find this very harmful to keep things inside. Kind of like a garbage can. Every, every time that something's bothering you or you're really carrying a burden, you just keep it inside. It's like putting something more in the garbage can. Then something else comes along, and you put that on top of that, and that on top of that. Pretty soon, the garbage is just overflowing, and you smell real bad. No, I, I don't know what makes me say stuff like that. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in the heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Find somebody who has a good word for you, and then you be that somebody in somebody else's life. You know, there are people today who are discouraged, and they need a somebody. They need a friend just to say, how are you doing? They need somebody to come along and just put their arm around them. They need somebody just to pick up the phone and say, you know, I know you're going through a tough time, and I just wanted to call and give you a word of encouragement. That's all you have to say. And that opens that door for that person to share with you. You be that someone in someone else's life. Number five, read the directions and do what they say. Read the directions and do what they say. In other words, be obedient. You know, I hope that each one of you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, go buy you a Bible and begin to read that Bible. You know, obedience sheds light on the hidden things of God. Obedience sheds light on the hidden things of God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You know what we need to do? We need to put some thrust in our trust. We need to trust the Lord with our whole life, with every part of our being, and then do what we're told. What happens is we know what we're supposed to do, and we may read the Bible, or we may hear a message from somebody. We know what's right, but then we go and do what's wrong. Why is it we do that? We need to be obedient. Read the directions and do what they say. Number six, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise noise. That's what the Bible says. The 100th Psalm says, make a joyful noise. Now, some of you have, have had the, the blessing uh, to have heard me sing before. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've never asked myself to sing here. I just kind of sing. But you know what's really helped me? And I do this every day. And I, I know you all think I'm weird, and I don't care. <laughs> but every day, I sing at least one song. And I usually sing it. I show it. People, we're out someplace, and I'll be acting crazy singing. And they'll ask, I says, is he always this way? She said, no, just when there's a crowd. <laughs> but I love to sing. And y'all have heard me tell a story about uh, going to speak to uh, different companies. And one of the points I always leave with them is sing at least one song a day. Came back a year later, and this guy comes up to me and said, aren't you the guy that was in here last year spoke to us? I said, yeah. And I, was kinda, I felt kind of good because he remembered that. He said, are you the guy that told us to sing at least one song a day? I said, yeah, that was me. He said, I wish you hadn't done that. I said, why is that? They said, Ralph is driving us crazy with that song every day. I said, well, what's he singing? And he was singing, my baby ran off of the garbage man. My baby ran off of the garbage man. I don't care about my baby, but who's going to empty them cans? <laughs> Sing a happy song. Charlotte and I, uh, 
Charles and I snuck off and went to, uh, we went to uh, Santa Fe uh, a few weeks ago. I love to go to Santa Fe. And uh, we, went to, we had this little restaurant. I don't remember the name of it. It's on the second floor, and it's kind of downtown there. And if you sit on the corner, all the windows open up. It's almost, almost like sitting on a terrace, except uh, you have to get that corner seat to really look out. I mean, down below, there's just hundreds of people. It was a big weekend all over the place. And uh, I got real quiet. And it scares Charlotte when I get real quiet <laughs> because she knew something's coming right after this. And so I leaned up, stood up, and leaned out the window and began to sing, zippity doo dahs <laughs> And I mean, everybody downstairs, they're waving, you know, and people in the restaurant, they're laughing, and Charlotte's just sitting there like this, you know. And... <laughs> but I guess that's one of my favorite old gospel songs, zippity doo that. <laughs> I don't guess any of y'all remember that song, do you? Huh? Anybody remember that song from Jungle Book, Walt Disney? I wondered if I'd start singing if anybody would sing along with me. You want to do that? Yeah. zippity doo da, zippity a. My, oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine had my way. zippity doo da, zippity a. Mr. Bluebird on my shoulder. It's a truth. It's factual. Everything is satisfactual. zippity doo da, zippity a. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Give yourself a hand. Woo! I love it. Now, this is what you need to do when you go back to work. And everybody listen. About 3.45, you call everybody together. And you go stand outside the boss's office. And you lead them in singing zippity doo dah. And then call me, let me know what happens. <laughs> Bring me your resume. <laughs> okay, number seven. Number seven. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. You know that 90% of the things that we worry about never, ever happen? Did you know that? 90% of the things we worry about never happen. And if they do happen, they're not near as bad as we thought they were going to be. You know, you know, if I ask you to write down the five things that you worried about last year, I'm talking about worried about. I'm talking about that kept you from going to sleep. I'm talking about that made you miserable. I'm talking about your hair started coming out. I'm talking about you couldn't eat or that's all you could do was eat, whichever one it was. I wonder how many of them actually happened. And, and if they did happen, were they near as bad as you thought they were going to be? Listen to me. If you want to manage the stress in your life, listen now, don't sweat the small stuff. Number eight, write this down. Remember, it's all small stuff. It's all small stuff. You know, you know I used to write on my, I had it on my telephone when I was an athletic director at Furman University, and I had these words because I allowed myself to get eaten up by stress. And one day I said, this is ridiculous. I'm living below the privilege that God established for me. You see, when Jesus Christ went to die on the cross for me and for my sins and for my failures, his shed blood cleansed all that stuff. And I was living below the privilege that God had established for me. And I thought to myself, boy, you're crazy. Why are you letting the joy of your life be related to the circumstances of the day? When there's so much out there, when you've got your health, your family, you've got friends, you've got a place to work. You got the beautiful nature that God's given. Why am I worried about this stuff? And I wrote on a piece of paper, I, I typed it and put it on my phone. In light of eternity, what difference does it make? In light of eternity, what difference does it make? Friends, let me tell you in closing today, don't, don't let stress eat your lunch. They're turning out the lights, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't let stress eat your life. Be victorious over the stress that you have. Learn to be a good bear wrestler. There's nothing, and I'm telling you nothing, that's out there today that you and God together can't handle. You believe that? That's right. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for everyone who came today. And Lord, I pray that as we go back to our work, as we go back into the marketplace or into our relationships or back with our family, Lord, that you'll give us a sense of perspective about what's really important. Lord, give us the wherewithal to deal with all the stuff we got to deal with in the world today. Lord, help us beginning right now as we leave here, Lord, to be able to, to deal with things and to keep a perspective, Lord, that would be focused on you. 
And Lord, I thank you that you love us so much, each one, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and rose again. And today we can worship a risen Savior. Lord, I thank you for each one who came today. Lord, I thank you for all the singers that came today. Lord, that are willing to make a joyful noise. Lord, I pray this day we'd make a joyful noise to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.